Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Cecile Sarabia. She is a postdoctoral researcher in cognitive ecology at Kyoto University in Japan. She investigates parasite avoidance behaviors and their effectiveness in non-human primates and other animals. She is generally interested in the origins of hygiene and disgust in humans and in the potential applications of disgust into, into the field of conservation. So, Dr. Sarabia, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, great. So uh, let's talk about this guest. What is this guest from an evolutionary perspective? So from an evolutionary perspective, I guess this guest can be defined as a system, a system based in neural tissue that would have evolved to detect sensory cues in the environment um, that animals would use and to lead to the behaviors um, that would reduce the risk of disease. So this may also provoke cognitive and physiological responses before these behavioral uh, responses. And in humans, um, there is actually evidence that uh, the region, a certain region of the brain is activated um, when we experience disgust. And this is known as the right anterior insular cortex, cortex of the brain. But we also have evidence in non-human primates, in rhesus macaques, for example, which um, shares a similar anatomical architecture with the human insula, that when this part of the brain is stimulated, it elicits various disgust-related behaviors. So, for example, when the macaques have um, food in the hand and this area of the brain is activated, they would throw it away. When the food is in the mouth, they will spit it out. And sometimes this stimulation may even provoke uh, vomiting. And in addition to that, these uh, these behaviors are associated with the characteristic facial expression of disgust, um, a wrinkling of the nose and the uh, upper uh, lip raised. So this is a facial expression that is exhibited by these uh, macaques, but do, that we also experience um, as humans when we, when we feel disgust. So scientists have made a considerable, considerable progress in understanding the structure and function of disgust, I feel, since the pioneering studies of Paul Rosin, uh, for example, and colleagues, who suggested an oral origin of this emotion. And there is now some consensus on the parasite-related origin of disgust while looking at it through an evolutionary perspective. And so for this, I would invite uh, people to refer to the work of uh, Val Curtis, um, the late Val Curtis from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, or Joshua Tiber from VU Amsterdam, and Debra Lieberman from the University of Miami, uh, whom I think uh, you have interviewed uh, for your show. Um, and just to be clear regarding definitions, when I refer to parasites, I mean all pathogenic and non-pathogenic organisms with a parasitic way of life. Mm -hmm. But should so we understand? It... Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was just um, jumping um, again on the evolutionary function. And just to make it simple, um, then disgust is here to protect us um, from getting sick and to help survival and reproduction. So um, individuals who would um, be more cautious regarding maybe what they eat, uh, who they mate with, or who they touch, uh, would have a fitness advantage from an evolutionary perspective compared to individuals who would be much less uh, cautious regarding uh, food or partners, for example. Mm -hmm. Should we think about this guest as an emotion? Is that the best way of thinking about it? Personally, um, I don't think so, <laughs> or I'm not sure. I think we should have a more um, complete picture, maybe, of um, I would call this system. I think, anyway, for those who consider disgust only as an emotion, um, it's still a continuum from this adaptive system that I've described earlier. And if we consider it as a search system, I think it applies to a wider array than uh, just humans. So beside the neurophysiological part, maybe, which remains to be better cerned in, in animals, although now, as I've mentioned, for rhesus macaques, but also for rodents, we, we have some evidence. Um, we are now accumulating more and more evidence for the mechanisms behind uh, the roots of, of disgust, behind parasite avoidance in animals as well. 
So there was a focus of, on disgust as an emotion with the work of um, Paul Rosin, for example, but the work of Valerie Curtis and others gave these um, foundations to expose disgust evolutionary functions by exploring the detection and aversion to disgust sensory cues in, in animals. So they gave this theoretical background, and that's how I think uh, ecologists, ethologists, and people working with animals came into play by testing this experimentally. Mm -hmm. Do we know how far back in evolutionary history we need to go to find this guest? I mean, how early in evolutionary history does it appear? That's a very good, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think it depends again how we yeah, how we see it, how we portray it. Um, so personally, I've been mainly uh, investigating the roots of disgust through uh, the behavior, behavioral component first. So parasite avoidance behaviors with non-human primates. Uh, but we can see uh, parasite avoidance in a large array of species from a very small um, <laughs> worm, for example, called Sinor abditis elegans, which is um, actually a parasite itself. And when it's placed in a petri dish with its pathogenic bacteria, it will worm away from it. Uh, another example um, of um, a very uh, distant phylogenetically uh, related species is the dung beetle. Um, when you um, expose a dung beetle to a binary choice of feces coming from herbivores. We know that dung beetles roll uh, feces uh, from herbivores. And, and the feces coming from a carnivore species, it would consistently um, go foraging towards the uh, feces coming from herbivores. And the scientists who were uh, testing these dung beetles actually tested which from which sensory cues it came from. And so um, the found out that phenol, which is a volatile compound um, that is uh, released during the decomposition of proteins by pathogenic bacteria um, in carnivore species and which provokes this distinctive smell, pat this pathogenic bacteria uh, are actually susceptible to infect the dung beetles. And so when this volatile compound was added to feces coming for, from herbivores, the dung beetles would also consistently avoid this uh, volatile compound. So we can find, we have examples of parasite avoidance in, in very, um, very distant um, related species. We actually, back in 2017, organized a Royal Society meeting with uh, Rachel McMillan from the Open University and with the help of Val Curtis. Um, on the evolution of parasite and pathogen avoidance behaviors. So our idea was to compile um, and to combine uh, experience and expertise from, from different scientists with different looking at uh, parasite avoidance and discussed with different lenses. So we had evolutionary psychologists, geneticists, ethologists, all working with very different species, whether it was humans, birds, fish, or, or primates. And all of us uh, came together with evidence of uh, parasite avoidance. So I think the roots of this guest, yes, are, are very evolutionarily uh, ancient. But to, to complete, uh, we, we have now kind of fragments, uh, whether it's from behavioral evidence or um, physiological evidence or even uh, cognitive evidence, but I think we need now to compile that in, 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 a, in species, in several species to, um, yeah, to show more of this evidence in animals. Mm -hmm. but, we find, but we find it in animals, right? Or are there any other species from other kingdoms who might also show uh, disgust-related behavior? Wow, very, <laughs> very, yeah, very good question. I've, I mean, I'm not aware of, um, there might be some examples in, in, in plants, it's, if that's what you mean, but um, I'm not sure I can, I can provide uh, examples here. So farther away than, than in the animal kingdom, yeah, I'm not, I'm not yet aware of such investigation, but um, it's something to look at. Yeah, sure. Okay, so and since you study primates, uh, in the, and in this case I'm referring particularly to non-human primates, what are some of the cues that they associate with 
pathogens, contaminants, and that activate this ghost, basically. So there are different sensory cues that actually are related to the um, epidemiology of the parasite um, or the pathogen in question. Um, so we, we actually started by testing visual cues. So primates being, I mean, one of the primary um, sensory system in primates is, is vision. So um, we started experiments with uh, Japanese macaques on a small island in the south part of Japan called Kojima and that's where um, we started using feces replica as uh, visual cues of biological contaminants so in these experiments the macaques the Japanese macaques were exposed to three different substrates um, they were exposed to a, fece a plastic feces replica a piece of brown plastic notebook that they've never been exposed before but it was the same material as the feces replica and a fresh con specific feces so they were exposed to these three items and on each of them we placed a grain of wheat. Um, so they had the choice to, to feed on either of these items. And what we observed is that <clears throat> all of the 16 uh, Japanese macaques we tested across the five trials fed atop the control substrate, so the piece of brown plastic notebook. But only six out of 16 fed atop the fresh conspecific feces and nine out of 16 atop the um, feces, plastic feces replica. So there was this significant uh, difference between the proportion of individuals feeding uh, on the control, where all of them fed, versus the feces replica and the, the fresh conspecific feces. Um, and then just, just to, to follow up on that experiment, we actually had a second condition where we wanted to increase the motivation of the individuals. So we increased the nutritive value of the food reward. We replaced the grain of wheat by half a peanut. Half a peanut is 16 times more calories than a grain of wheat. And we observed that there was no avoidance anymore. So the macaques would feed atop all the three substrates. So this introduced the first trade-off we, we realized in this potential parasite avoidance, which is between the potential uh, food value or the nutritive value of the food and um, the, the infection risk. Um, so with visual cues, we were later on uh, able to expand um, these experiments with more primate species, with long-tailed macaques, mandrills, chimpanzees, and um, all of them showed some levels of avoidance that were expressed behaviorally uh, either by uh, lower feeding rates or higher proportions of manipulating the food, such as rubbing it, rolling it, or even washing it before ingesting it, um, or in terms of uh, latency of feeding. So whether they would first go towards the controlled substrate versus the, um, versus the, the feces replica. Um, so this was for visual cues. Then in there are other sensory cues that we have been able to test, such as uh, olfactory ones. So olfactory cues of biological contaminants, feces, but not only. So with 13 species, we were able to test through olfactory cues only, uh, blood and semen, for example, or even um, rotten food, such as rotten fruit and rotten meat. And again, in the foraging context, we observed uh, different avoidance behaviors towards food that was associated with, with these smells. Um, so now um, I'm kind of following up on that. After having investigated the, the behavioral part, I would like to know how these olfactory um, cues may impact cognition. Um, and by this, so I'm currently testing chimpanzees here at the Primate Research Institute of Kyoto University. Um, in a very familiar task on touch screens. Um, this is called the number task. So the chimpanzees have to touch numbers in an ascending order. And um, at the same time, they are exposed to different smells. And I'm basically testing how this may impact their uh, cognitive performance, their latency to perform in this co familiar cognitive task. Uh, but we are also uh, planning to test their physiological responses uh, to these olfactory cues. So. These are some of the sensory cues we, we are um, exploring. And among uh, the last one we have been able to explore is uh, tactile cues. So different, tested had been, uh, different senses had been tested in, in parasite avoidance in both uh, humans and animals. Um, but touch is probably the least investigated uh, despite the fact that many diseases 
can are transmitted through direct contact. So for this particular experiment that we have been able to do with chimpanzees in Gabon, we replicated actually a study that has been conducted in, in humans by um, Um and colleagues, including Debra Lieberman, um, where people were asked to plunge their hands into an opaque box um, and were exposed to either to two types of substrates, so varying in physical characteristics, one of them mimicking uh, pathogen presence, such as a soft and moist piece of dough, another one used as a control with opposite physical characteristics, so dry and hard piece of rope. So the chimpanzees in Gabon were exposed to uh, the same opaque box. Um, they were seeing me placing a piece of banana inside the box. They didn't know on which substrate it relied on. And in order to reach for the banana, they had to touch the substrate. And so it was either the soft and moist piece of dough or the dry and hard piece of rope. And what we observed is that after they touched the, the dough, the chimpanzee would withdraw the hand and wouldn't go for another trial. So they basically wouldn't feed on the on the piece of banana. Um, whereas for, for the rope condition, we had a much higher uh, and significantly higher proportion of individuals feeding after touching this dry um, and hard substrate. So um, these are some of the some of the sensory cues we, we have been able to test. Um, but there is more, yeah, more to explore. There is also early evidence of uh, taste um, aversion. So toxins, uh, as we know, are warning signals of noxious chemicals. They also elicit facial expressions of disgust in humans and in other uh, primates, animals, as it has been shown in rats, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, um, and other old world and new world primates. So. When these species were exposed to bitter compounds, such as quinine, which is a plant uh, alkaloid, um, the, it was uh, rejected by these uh, newborns of the species, and they expressed tongue protrusion, um, gaping or grimacing, um, and similarly, and to a lower extent, sour taste, such as citric acid, uh, is also aversive to human newborns who express similar facial expressions. So it's quite interesting, actually, how um, toxins or um, toxic food and, um, for example, contaminated foods um, sometimes elicit similar um, expression, ex similar yeah, um, behavioral expressions that are uh, related to, to disgust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but are some of these cues non-human primates respond to with disgust? learned or are they all innate? That's a, yeah, a, ver a very good question as well. Well, it seems that it, de it depends again, maybe on the um, epidemiology of the infectious agent related to, um, to the contaminant in question. So if we take, for example, um, yeah, the example of uh, feces, um, Primates, including human primates, may not exhibit um, strong aversion towards feces uh, up to a certain age. Um, so in humans, it's uh, around five years um, of age or later. If you observe non-human primates, you would see um, infants and juveniles uh, playing with conspecific poo. You wouldn't, you wouldn't see adults uh, doing so. So, but you would, you would, for example, observe uh, human neonates when exposed to uh, butyric acid under their nose via cotton tips. So the butyric acid is a major volatile compound present in vomit. They would also express this uh, facial expression of disgust. Um, but um, so feces may harbor a wide range of um, parasites, but which may not necessarily cause um, innate uh, sorry, which may not necessarily cause um, instant, well, instant risk of death, for example, maybe compared to a noxious um, chemical or um, something that has cues that the risk is more is more imminent. So although this needs clearly um, further investigations, from the evidence we have so far, it seems that some responses um, are innate versus some others seems to be uh, later on acquired. And 
one of the potential functions also of um, acquiring these uh, behavioral avoidance later is also to help us build uh, the physiological immune system. So by being exposed to these biological contaminants from an early age, you're also building uh, primates, for example, are also building their physiological immune system, which may, um, once this is developed, then uh, behaviors can 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 take um, can take the relay, if I may say. Mm -hmm. I also asked you that because I mean there are primates apart from humans who have culture, right? So I was imagine I was just thinking that perhaps it could be possible that some of these disgust related behaviors would be culturally transmitted not only in humans but also in other non human primates. <laughs> Yes, so if we, we have um, an example of this, uh, I don't know if you are aware of this famous sweet potato washing behavior in, in, um, in Japanese macaques. So this was a behavior observed and studied since the 1950s, uh, which started actually on Koshima Island, so this small, small island in the south of Japan, and which was mainly studied from this um, cultural lens and how it's transmitted from mother to offspring. Um, but our experiments um, with the same Japanese macaques uh, of Koshima Island actually showed that uh, this um, washing behavior was significantly more expressed when the macaques were exposed to pieces of sweet potatoes that were covered with sand. Sand can be conducive of uh, parasites as well. And uh, versus when the piece of sweet potato that was uh, washed with tap water beforehand they would, there was almost no washing. So I think uh, both are not necessarily exclusive. I think it can be also uh, a behavior can be culturally uh, transmitted, but can still have for function to avoid uh, parasites, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, when it comes to, uh, okay, so let's say that a particular animal is exposed to something that elicits disgust. So, there's I'm, there's perhaps two ways of dealing with it. The, it can eliminate that source of uh, contamination or of pathogens, or it can, uh, after it had contact with it directly, it can elicit some behaviors that would lead to the elimination of that uh, threat, for example. Yeah, right. Um, I think, as you said, so these behaviors can be preventive um, in nature, and this can, I don't know if I have to give examples in, in, in humans, for example, be seen when we would avoid touching a public uh, toilet seat, for example, uh, or when we keep our distance with uh, someone we feel um, has a bad smell. And regarding the latter, there is actually, actually a quite cool study by um, Olson and colleagues which has uh, shown that people who have been injected with lipopolysaccharides, which would activate the physiological immune system, increase the body temperature, and um, provoke actually a less pleasant body odor um, in people that were injected compared to persons who received a placebo. So another group of subjects was assessing these body odors uh, via the t-shirts that um, these injected uh, people had worn for, for several hours after, after injection. Um, regarding the elimination of contaminants, there are multiple um, rituals, if I may say, of uh, washing or fumigation that are observed around the world to, for example, wipe, uh, wash off or clean human bodies for sanitation purposes. Um, even in humans, in human communities who do not have much access to water, for example, we observe some form of anointment to protect and uh, clean the skin. So in humans, you, you observe both of this nature, preventive and, um, and getting rid of. Um, and yeah, I can, I can also provide, uh, I think, later examples on uh, non-human primates, for example, in non-human primates. Um, uh, so both of these kinds of behaviors, like preventative behaviors and uh, elimination, let's say, behaviors, they all fall under the rubric of hygiene. Are those all hygienic behaviors or not? I think that's how we would um, we would still yeah consider them as even so 
if the overall aim is to reduce the risk of uh, infection and acquiring disease, um, even maintenance behaviors um, such as that we can see uh, as em eliminating behaviors <laughs> um, would, would still serve this, this purpose of reducing um, the risk of, of, of getting disease. So there are examples um, in non human I think the closest example of this in non-human primates would be, for example, grooming, which is uh, a universal behavior in non-human primates, um, whether it's self-grooming, but also social grooming. And uh, the primary function of grooming is actually to remove louse eggs from uh, an individual's fur. And lice are um, actually um, socially transmitted ectoparasites that can transmit disease. So there have been um, observations showing that body parts that are estimated to have um, many louse eggs in Japanese macaques, for example, are the ones that the other macaques fo focus on and that are groomed with a higher frequency uh, than other parts. And there are advantages of being groomed for the individual in the end also, um, but also for the group to prevent uh, pathogen transmission. So I think I, I would consider yeah both sorts of behaviors to be seen as a holistic um, holistic picture mm -hmm. uh, so uh, i have to ask you this question since we're going through this covid 19 pandemic do you think that there are aspects of how people react to this pathogen that can be better understood through the sort of evolutionary lens mm. I'm not sure what, what you mean. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, uh, perhaps, uh, what, what do I mean, exa do I mean exactly? I, I think that, okay, so by being aware of the presence of mm. this pathogen, do, can we better understand how people react yeah. to it through an evolutionary lens? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was one of, one of the examples I had in mind regarding COVID, for example. I think now that people also have the, the knowledge and have been exposed to the risk, for example, the, we have seen that wearing a mask seems to be maybe more um, evident uh, in people who were maybe not used to do so before. So experience like this and um, yeah, pandemic can have behavioral changes at the society uh, level as well. And maybe that would um, yeah, also help um, better understand the, the, the function of this guest. So um, I would say yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, th there's another question here, and because I also had other uh, these guest researchers on the show, and you mentioned some of them, like Val Curtis, Joshua Tiber, and Deborah Lieberman. Uh, there are uh, so there's these different ways of classifying different kinds of disgust. So, for example, people talk about pathogen disgust, sexual disgust, and then there are some people that say that there's another domain called moral disgust. So, what is your take on that? So, um, I, in in animals, I think this this uh, different domains of disgust uh, could be yeah, investigated or remains to be tested. But if we take, uh, if we look again at the continuum of disgust, what we observe and what we know in terms of parasite avoidance is that it's expressed in different contexts in animals as well. So in a social and sometimes sexual uh, context, but also in a foraging or environmental context, in all these contexts, the avoidance was linked to parasite infection risk. So for example, in wild female olive baboons, and in Tanzania, and this population was susceptible to uh, Triponema pallidum, which um, causes syphilis uh, in humans, for example, and provoked these uh, ulcerations around genital parts in baboons. Um, so the females would uh, mate significantly less, have less sexual contact with males that were having these uh, genital ulcerations, or if they were having it themselves. Then in another social but non-sexual context, uh, Western lowland gorillas in the Congo, for example, um, a population also susceptible to another triponema causing yos and these severe skin lesions on the face um, showed that females were more likely to emigrate out of the group 
if um, um, the proportion of individuals among the group was uh, severely affected by this um, pathogen. And same if the silverback, so the higher ranking individual among the group, the silverback is the the, the male <laughs> with, uh, with the silverback, the highest ranking individual um, among the group, the having severe skin, uh, skin lesions on the face, females were more likely to, to get out of the group as well. Uh, in a foraging context, this is mainly what uh, our experiments have been exploring with various species uh, of primates showing uh, aversions towards food that was associated with different sensory cues of biological contaminants. And in an environmental uh, context, Clement Sprout and colleagues from um, the German Primate Center have shown that um, mandrills would use um, movement patterns that were correlated with the avoidance of infective stages of gastrointestinal parasites in the environment. So now, I think that attempting at testing moral disgust in animals slash primates, for example, would be fascinating, but um, it hasn't been been done yet. So I think the, the, the debate that maybe we, we observe in, in, in humans is, uh, yeah, so far seems, seems to share um, similar trends in, um, in animals with a similar function and, and, and origins of avoiding these this parasites. Um, but for, yeah, for moral disgust, I, <clears throat> I think there is, at least maybe in primates, um, in a very um, design setting in the lab, maybe not impossible to, to test with great apes, but um, this hasn't been tested to, to my knowledge, at least. Mm -hmm. But do you agree that in humans, there's that third domain of disgust, moral disgust, because there are people that don't really agree with that? Mm. I think, yeah, um, it's, less, it's less in my area of, of, of expertise, so <laughs> I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have strong, strong conclusions. But I think there were correlations between moral disgust and other domains of disgust as well, right? So, um, so again, maybe having evidence in other species of humans uh, for this would, would maybe uh, convince, me, convince me more. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, let me ask you one question, and since we're talking about humans and other primates, to what extent is it possible to compare uh, disgust-related behavior across species? Because, for example, you mentioned chimpanzees and gorillas, and also Japanese macaques, and I think, if I remember correctly, Japanese macaques are not as closely related to humans as chimpanzees and gorillas. So to what extent is it possible to extrapolate from uh, those species to humans? Well, I think if that, that's why we actually tested, um, yeah, we wanted to test more primate species to see exactly to test this continuum and whether we would observe um, similar responses um, in, all, in all the species. But again, I think it's good to, to remind here that there are, of course, numerous trade-offs at play uh, when we talk about uh, parasite avoidance or disgust. Um, it's still very plastic to the local environments, to the risks that the species, this specific species is, is experiencing in this environment. Um, you may ob observe even variation uh, among um, the same species living in different environments, for example, depending on the susceptibility to a certain uh, parasite risk or the transmission pathway. Um, but with all that said, and with all these uh, trade-offs, I don't know, maybe we can, I, I can mention them uh, later, there is still, um, there still seems to be um, common traits uh, when we talk about um, um, avoidance of contaminated food in a foraging context. So this was basically um, observed in um, in all these different uh, species, for example. Um, with yeah, but again with with, with trade-offs. So I think I remember one of your. Uh, I've also listened to an interview that you have done with um, Dr. Diana Fleischmann on this guest, and uh, I remember this part of the interview where she mentioned that uh, chimpanzees or uh, animals or primates don't don't have this guest, um, because she, she mentions this example of um, 
this classic example that we can observe sometimes with zoo, zoo animals um, doing coprophagy, or what, we, what is called as coprophagy. And I think what I would like to, to, to mention here is that, first of all, um, so yes, chimpanzees or, or gorillas have this reputation of sometimes uh, eating feces. Uh, but I would remind our listeners that first coprophagy in captivity and coprophagy in the wild, even some scientists don't agree to call that coprophagy in the wild, is actually quite different. Um, because in the wild, so it's mainly what we call seed reingestion. The, the chimpanzee, for example, would defecate in its own hands so um, and would reingest the seeds that were um, undigested of specific fruits, for example. Um, so in terms of novel pathogen acquisition, um, the, 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 the argument is, is less uh, relevant here, or it would be of very close affiliated individuals, so in, in modern infants. Um, whereas in captivity, you may observe uh, behaviors that you, you don't observe in the wild, such as eating maybe entire feces, uh, but this has been more associated with uh, stress, for example, or the captive conditions, or pa painting the wall of the enclosure with feces. So, yeah, these behaviors are, are not, not observed um, in the wild. So, um, and as we have seen, even with the dung beetle example, so coprophagy, again, it all depends on, uh, on the risk um, that, that, that this fecal material may um, may pose to, to the individual or species in question. So, mm -hmm. so you mentioned some trade-offs there. Could you tell us more about it? Sure. So I've mentioned for the Japanese macaques, if you remember, uh, this nutritive value of the food and the potential infection risk, right? So we, we, we observed that Japanese macaques would avoid uh, feeding atop fresh con specific feces and plastic feces replica for a grain of wheat, but they wouldn't do so for, uh, um, for peanuts, for example. And this is a trade of um, nutritive value or hunger even in humans that uh, has been shown with food deprived subjects, for example, expressing a weaker rise of the upper lip while watching unpalatable foods. Um, so for food, um, food and, and, and infection, there is there is this trade-off. Um, for, for for example, um, ties re regarding the, the the individual. So by this I mean, in mandrills, for example, um, so mandrills would avoid grooming uh, con specifics that are infected with gastrointestinal parasites. Uh, these gastrointestinal parasites are transmitted through the what we call the fecal oral route. That means by getting in contact with microparticles of feces, you may acquire the infective stage of that parasite and ingest it. So through grooming, it's easy, for example. And um, a st another study by Clemence Poirot has shown that uh, mothers of uh, the highly uh, infected mandrills would actually be the only one left to groom their parasitized offspring while no other individuals among the group would, would do so. Um, a parallel um, study or example in humans is um, the levels of disgust parents express towards uh, the diaper of older infants, but wouldn't uh, do so towards the diaper of their own infants. Uh, so this is an, an, another trade-off related again to the risk um, that is um, that they are exposed um, by being in contact with foreign biological contaminants compared to to their own or to closely affiliated individuals. Do we find any major sex differences when it comes to levels of disgust and how males and females experience them? Yes. Um, so in most of the species we have been uh, testing, we were able to test for sex differences. So for uh, the Japanese macaques, for example, we were able to assess um, what we called hygienic tendencies, so their propensity to avoid feeding atop uh, fresh con specific feces, but also their propensity to manipulate, so process the food before ingesting it. Uh, and this was done through observations while they were foraging under the leaf litter in the forest, whether they would rub acorns, for example, or not, uh, but also with this piece of sweet potatoes, whether they would wash it uh, or not. So with all these experiments and observations, we were able to have um, to map out how each individual would score on these uh, hygiene proxies. 
And we observed that uh, females would significantly score higher. So they would um, avoid more conspecific feces and they would process their food more often than males. And interestingly, this was also related with the parasite load uh, in this species. So in parallel of conducting this experiment, we were also able to collect their fecal samples and to assess their levels of parasite infection. These macaques were infected with two gastrointestinal parasites at the time of the study, what we call nematodes, uh, that are transmitted again through these fecal oral routes. Um, and so females who had higher hygienic scores were also uh, the one with lower levels of infection. Another study in um, non-human primates, in this cool nocturnal primate called uh, gray mouse lemurs uh, from Madagascar, um, a team yeah, led by, by Clement Sport again, kind of replicated uh, our experiments, but expanding. So not only testing for um, feeding, um, feeding aversion toward contaminated food, but also drinking uh, aversion toward contaminated water with conspecific feces, um, sleeping site preferences, defecation patterns, and showing that um, individuals would um, express what they called hygienic personalities because their behavioral tendencies were consistent across time and space. So you'd have some of these gray mouse lemurs who would consistently avoid uh, foraging or drinking on contaminated food and water, who would uh, avoid sleeping in a contaminated place, or who would avoid defecating in the area they were sleeping in. And they related that this time not to the uh, levels of parasite infection, so and by this, I mean, we use the number of parasite eggs per gram of feces. This is a measure used in parasitology. But they used the, what we call parasite richness. So the number of parasite species present in the individuals. So the diversity of parasites. And they observed that individuals who were more hygienic had a lower diversity uh, of parasites. For other primate species, we also observe this female bias in, in, in mandrills towards um, avoidance of contaminated food, um, but we haven't been able yet to relate it uh, to the um, infection. And we haven't been able, however, to um, see any sex differences in chimpanzees and bonobos, interestingly. But these tests were t were done with captive chimpanzees and, and um, bonobos from, from a sanctuary. So I'm actually looking forward to um, analyze the data from white bonobos. This is next <laughs> on the list. Um, and I think, yes, before drawing strong conclusions and sex and age uh, differences in these species, at least for chimps and, and, and bonobos, um, I would like to investigate um, further, yeah, having more, more subjects and more samples maybe from, from white populations. Uh, but just to say that um, these sex differences in behaviors is also, um, so it's actually quite common in non-human primates, but in mammals in general, to have a male biased parasitism. And, um, and again, if we um, go to the potential um, evolutionary roots of this, is females having usually a higher uh, burden in terms of offspring care, um, would, um, yeah, it's predicted that uh, they would be more cautious regarding uh, anything that can be can be infectious. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if we can talk about this here, but in the case of humans, do we know if there's any human universals? I mean, things that we see occurring across all different cultures and societies. Uh, in terms of the things people react to with this guest? So I think this is something that uh, yeah, Val Curtis also brought up. Um, and I love her book called uh, Don't Look, Don't Touch, um, where in this, this book she recalls a massive study that they have done over three continents um, showing how bodily fluids such as uh, feces, blood, semen, or bad breath, vomit, mucus, but as well as rotten flesh and vermin, all elicited reports of disgust uh, sensitivity in the human, different human populations they were, they were testing. So then the, the level of uh, knowledge regarding these disgust elicitors may contain um, 
as pathogens and how they, they transmit may lead to variations in hygienic practices. So I think that's what we were talking on earlier. Uh, for example, whether it's washing and washing hands with or without soap, uh, COVID and, and wearing the mask. So, um, and that was actually her work on um, trying to, to use this gas to be implemented in um, public health campaigns to, to actually increase these behaviors. So there is universal, it seems that there is universal disgust elicitors, but it's also plastic to the local environment, depending on the risks, the transmission pathways of the parasites, uh, and depending on the, the trade-offs we, we have mentioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have here one last topic that I would like to explore. You're also interested in conservation. So is there any connection between you, the work you do on uh, disgust and hygienic behaviors and conservation? So I, this is very preliminary yet, but I see potential connections. Uh, yes, I think, again, if we take the example of disgust applications to public health, one can think of further, further applications. So, for example, um, there are two major human wildlife conflicts um, issues. One is called uh, crop raiding. So this is when um, an animal species would um, invade farm fields and devastate uh, the plantations of, of farmers. So this creates massive um, problems um, in Asia and Africa with um, different species of primates, for example, baboons and elephants. Um, and in the case of carnivores, it would be livestock depredation. So and lots of the strategies currently uh, used, such as electrical fences, snares, poison, or guarding, are rather based on anthropogenic needs uh, than considering the ecology or adaptive systems of, of these species. So I see one potential avenue of research uh, using the adaptive system of discussing the species, um, testing which aversive sensory cues for this species might be relevant, design and test apparatus in the field, and then maybe validate and distribute uh, the methods. Um, there have been actually some recent studies showing um, how conditioned taste aversion in uh, rhesus macaques in India was actually efficient in deterring them from uh, feeding um, and across time. So this is actually quite quite promising. Now, yeah, we need to think of ways to implement that in, in the field. And another recent study in uh, African elephants actually testing this volatile compound that I've mentioned, phenol, uh, that is elicited by pathogenic bacteria during the decomposition prote of proteins in carnivore feces, and also eliciting foraging aversion in these African elephants. Um, so I think this could be one way to <clears throat> to think um, to think differently about mitigating human wildlife um, conflict issues. So this is one potential avenue of research for the application of disgust um, in conservation. The other one is actually to use um, our own sense of disgust, as it has been uh, used in public health campaigns, to maybe better enforce uh, ecotourism practices. So one of the other, other uh, human wildlife um, potential conflict issue is uh, this proximity that we are having more and more with wildlife. As the um, global human population uh, grows, this um, we are more and more in contact uh, with wildlife. This is uh, largely promoting uh, sometimes in social media. Um, and before the pandemic, what we could observe in ecotourism, if we take the examples of great apes, for example, is that there were guidelines and recommendations in place, so keeping the seven meter distance and wearing a mask to actually avoid bringing new pathogens to these um, to these communities of great apes that have probably not been exposed to 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 the pathogens we may carry, and vice versa. Uh, but before COVID, um, there was actually very low enforcement of these rules. So uh, studies showed that the, the reality was more like 2.8 meters in terms of distance and no mask, uh, which is not sufficient to, to prevent uh, potentially um, very infectious pathogens to, to be transmitted. So <clears throat> one way would be to use the, the same strategy as in public health to maybe design campaigns specifically targeting um, these tourists to to better keep, <laughs> to use disgust um, in them to, 
to make them keep their distance and wear masks and have appropriate behaviors. So mm -hmm. that's how I see potential um, applications and what I'm actually interested in, in working on in, in the future. So taking all this knowledge uh, that we have in terms of behavior and maybe now um, forthcoming on cognition and physiology and try to design uh, applications in, in this in, in new, new areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So let's end on that note. Just before we go, uh, where can people find your work on the internet? Um, you can, I have actually a, a website to share, <laughs> to share this kind of work. So you can go uh, on www.cecilsarabian.com. You can also uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, yeah, and I think that's, that's about it. Um, and on my website, you would be able to see videos of the experiments I've mentioned, um, yeah, as well as the publications and etc. Okay, so Dr. Sarabia, uh, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. That was very fun. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been doing the channel for more than three years now. And it is thanks to people like you that it's been running for so long. And so if you like what I'm doing, please pay a visit to my Patreon page or to PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. And to consider making a pledge there, support the show. And otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share, share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Yevan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Librand, Oslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Sam, uh, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araujo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Miran B., Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Max Bailby, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Alan or uh, Al Orwitz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Elman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafinia, Kian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Tom Venegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardos France, and Niroban Balachandran. And my executive producers, Michelle Ruzieski, Rosie James Pratt, and Matthew Lavender. Thank you for all. <laughs>